start Whoa. recording right away. All right, yeah, I guess we'll start. We'll start doing this. Okay, hi. It's recording in progress. I can't. These are noise canceling headphones. I can't hear myself. All right, yeah. Just let's just hit the ground running. All right, welcome. You. <laughs> You hate these sunglasses so much. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, it's very... It's, it's bright it's in here. Brayton of you. <laughs> yeah, you're like kind of Team Brayton. The mysterious underground of human design. Ah, well, this is... um. Let's... I mean, I can edit this. What I'll do is I'll just, like, cut the no. little... It's to, yeah, I will. Yeah, sure you will. <clears throat> All right. Welcome to the Frequencies Podcast with my guest, Dave Myers, Neutrino Radio. Yeah. So I've been taking notes on things to talk about. Um, I don't have too much yet. Uh, do you have any uh, anything you'd like to talk about today, Dave? Is that... I mean... I'm sure we could come up with something. How about uh, Austin HD Fest 2024? Really? I guess um, we could. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. Um, yeah, I, I can't see why that wouldn't be doable. I don't know how much of it would happen at my house, but we could do it. Could do the a whole thing. thing is at Easy Tiger. The whole thing, <laughs> just at the Easy Tiger. Um, Hell yeah! By depending on tables. depending on where the sun is in the sky, like how how much we can bear of of sunlight, we'd be locating in different areas, different patios and such. Yeah, we just kind of rotate throughout the day as the sun shifts. I spent quite a bit of my time, um, well, I shouldn't say quite a bit. I spent 20 minutes or half an hour today trying to explain time zones. It felt like longer than 20 minutes. I saw you doing that. Yeah, so you actually, it actually takes you that long to, to type all of that because I was under the impression that you were some sort of, I don't know, like Star I Trek. It actually, I know how long it is because when I started typing it, I said the current time and it was like 3.43 p.m. I'm not talking about the original post. That was like two minutes. But in the comments, I was like, okay, the current time as of typing right now is 3.43 p.m. locally. And at the end, it was like 4.02. So I know that it took me, you know, 20 minutes or so. Well, that's okay. I thought you said hour and a half. No, no, no. It was about 20 minutes. Okay, okay. But, but I mean, time zones, I mean, as I was writing them, I realized it's hard to explain how they work. I actually, I looked on Reddit. I looked on the Explain It Like I'm Five Reddit, which is kind of a nice, um, just for getting like brief explanations of things. And nobody could explain time zones. Like nobody could do it. There were all these attempts at explaining time zones and they were all equally confusing and complicated. So how okay. would you explain, like, can you explain time zones? <clears throat> I'd like to think that I can. All right. So because the sun is, is never, doesn't stay, the, the, as the, the earth rotates, the sun seemingly goes around the earth from our perspective. And so we've got daytime and nighttime. And for some reason we want daytime and nighttime to be the same time of day, roughly, no matter where you are. So the morning is always, you know, wherever you live in the world, the morning time is like five to 11. You know, and the afternoon is like noon to four. And, and that's when the sun is, noon is when the sun's right overhead and afternoon is kind of. Right? Speaking. Yeah, so. noon is like the, it's right there. Mm -hmm. So then in order to do that, the, it can't be the same time everywhere in the world at the same time. 
So, so we have to have time zones in order for different places to identify uh, with like what time it is generally where it is. Now, some people are, some places are like, fuck all that noise. Either we don't believe in time zones or we're going to do like a half an hour difference for some crazy reason. Or, you know, like we're, we're with these guys. We always were with these guys. We're staying in their time zone. And then in 1962, in, yeah. this happened and these guys decided to switch over to that one. And this I one, these guys started to... doing daylight savings. Yeah. That's what you're talking about is so, daylight savings time. A lot of people hate it. But even still, there's like even the time zones there's disputes between like who's in what time zone and there'll even be a country or a, a place that would seemingly be split into three time zones but they're just like we all want to just be one time zone Do you know what i but mean there's like really stuff like that on, yeah it's like roughly based on geographical divisions but, but it's not there's entirely there's records of what everything was at any point in history for the most part, so yeah. you can that's what the calculator takes into account so it has nothing to do really with location and just the location will be used as data in the database to figure out what time it was when someone was born <laughs> That's a really good description. That was very good. I, I applaud. That was really, um, thank you. Yeah. It's hard making it simple. You know, it's, I think the way you explained it with the sun and how a different, like you kind of gave the reason why we have time zones in the first place. Cause if we didn't have time zones, 12 noon would be like the middle of the night, some places, and it would be morning, other places and evening, other places. And yeah. So instead, we kind of just make it so 12 noon is when the sun is overhead. And that means that's what we call local time. And then we have to convert from local time uh, to universal time or to uh, the Julian date, which is what scientists often use. Um, yeah, no, that's a good description. So I, I had a pretty good day. I mean, I, uh, I don't mind these kind of conversations. I love... I don't spend as much time on Facebook as I used to. I used to spend hours each day. You know who kind of took the mantle and who I felt just so happy to discover her work? It was like three years ago now. Dive in. Two mm -hmm. or three years ago when Dive in, and for those who don't know who I'm talking about, Diana Ellie Vin, uh, she she began, uh, now she's a reader, and I mean, but she still is such, she just answers so many questions. Like, She'll be on Human Design and Astrology, Human Design Interactive, Human Design Catalyst, any of these Facebook groups. Just any question anyone has, she just jumps in. Is she a first it. line? Amazing. She's a 1-3, yeah. Okay. And she blew everyone away the first year of the HDHD conference because we'd be talking and I'd be like, oh yeah, I have gate 25, line 5. And then she would just start rattling off 25-5 from the Ray V. Ching. I'm like, wait, how do you know that? Oh like, yeah, the exalted is this and the detriment. I mean, it's like she had the whole Ray V. Ching in her head somehow. And that was that was pretty impressive. So, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of felt like when she picked up on these Facebook groups that I could kind of, my, you know, my, my work was done. I, I, I kind of handed off the uh, mantle to her because I used to be... Yeah. The always baton. answering every question every yeah i kind of handed off the baton oh i was like thank you thank you so awesome yeah there's not enough still... insane people to do that thank well, god you know, yeah, dive in thank you for doubling the the information pool of people who are willing to just like give everything they've got my god yeah well i mean it because it's also kind of the sneaking suspicion that if I can't explain it to somebody that I don't really know it, you know? And so, right. Kind of, uh, yeah. And you were able to really explain time zones very well. I mean, I have a hard time sometimes explaining things in a non-technical way or giving the reasons behind them or kind of the, um, 
you know, telling the story of it. And you, you did a great job with that. Actually, this is a good opportunity. Why don't I uh, pull up your chart here? And we can see, ah, so you have that 1222, knowing how to articulate something. But then you also have 3536, which can really be quite an evocative uh, speaker. Talking about I'm also feelings. just terrible with like memorizing and I'm I have like sh just a crappy keynoter. Like I can't, I can't talk HD. Like I, I can't do the traditional keynotes. I can't. Sometimes I put, pull it out of my ass, but I'm a terrible keynoter. Yeah, I mean that's you know we all we each have a different area that we kind of zoom into or that we learn about or that we. I mean. We have different gifts. Something uh, Richard Tarnas said that I really liked. He's a great astrologer, and he uh, wrote the book Cosmos and Psyche, where he pretty much uses the planets and he uses the cycles of the planets, when they are conjunct, when they're square, when they're opposition, to tell the history of the world, particularly Western history, but also basically world history, and specifically the last 500 years. Um, but he goes beyond it as well. And he was asked in a Q&A, so I noticed, you know, that you use the planets and that you really are looking at the planet synodic cycles, which is the cycles of the planets. How about signs? You know, what about houses? What house system do you use? And so on. And he said, uh, as an astrologer, just planets and aspects were so deep to him that he could just spend all this time, he can write a whole book just looking at the planets and the aspects they make to each other, not including houses, not including signs. But that somebody else might really learn about houses, or they might really learn about, and there's other aspects too. I mean, when you get deep into astrology, there's, I mean, um, the Deccans, there's the, there's so much. People get into, um, in, you know, Hellenistic astrology, they, which kind of an older version, they, that has a big comeback in the last 10 years or so. Uh, people talk about, um, God, what are they even called? The, there's, there's these special terms of um, kind of, you know, the, the master, the time lords or something. Have you heard about this? Time lord? There's I mean, a whole Dr. Who? Astrology. <laughs> well, there's a whole astrological system where they kind of look at what planet is going to be important for you this year. So you might be like, oh, I have Saturn conjuncting my moon this year. And they're like, yeah, but according to the Time Lord system, Saturn's not actually important to you this year. Venus is important. So my point isn't which of these are right. It's kind of just when you spend enough time with them, you learn to use them in practical ways. And that's actually my answer for the sidereal astrology people as well, which is people will say, which is correct, sidereal or tropical astrology not human design not human design but astrology and i say well you know somebody who studied sidereal astrology for 20 years a uh, you know geotisha expert is going to absolutely be able to tell you all sorts of incredible things using that system because they've studied it and they've learned how to interpret it and how to use it the same way that a tropical astrologer can really tell you a lot of interesting things that does not apply to sidereal human design. I don't, I don't uh, think that any, first of all, nobody's even looked at it for 20 years. It's such a recent thing. I changed my mind about sidereal human design. I think it's great. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think really? that, yeah, I think that everybody should just go do that. Go, go do sidereal and what, uh, um, what have a nice, spurred, have a nice day. What spurred uh, this change, Dave? Oh, I just, you know, I don't, I'm not, who am I to tell anybody what's, what's right or wrong, but I think you should go mm. do sidereal. That sounds great. Go do that. Is this the antisocial part of the, the 12 year? Is that what you're <laughs> pretending to be Maybe. social? Maybe. Maybe so. Well, um, but yeah, you know, it's all changed. I, I can't, changed my mind. I kind of forgot. I forgot that you had the, uh, 3254, um, we talked about this before, but do you, right, we, we did talk about this. You've forgotten you, it before. I also forgot it before. Yeah, it's yeah. because you I just always, like focus. always forget. Because, yeah, the yeah. double barrel, how can you, I mean, that's. 
that's my manifestor shit right there. Well, and also I have 54 and I also have 12. So theoretically, mm. the way I really see you is as a 35, 36. That's kind of when I see you, I see you as this adventurous, exciting. This is why I keep, you know, inviting you to go on trips and, and you know, come with right. me on this trip. I, I see this 35, 36. And because when you have a compromise, you don't really see the, the person's full channel. It's kind of where we don't really see each other as much. I mean, that's something Ra pointed out, which is dominance, where one person has the whole channel and the other has none. That's where you really see them. Because you so, used to compromise my 46 and, uh, and nine and nine and my nine. So you mm -hmm. actually maybe. But so funny, necessarily... like, yeah. The only non compromise channel we have together is the 35, 36. Which it just goes to show compromise is not so bad. I mean, it's <clears throat> it, it might run into problems, but it's not. It's only really bad when you're expecting it to be something other than what it is, you know. So. But yeah, this thirty two fifty four. Um, I always see that as as the makeover channel as really helping other people transform their lives, helping them get a new partner, helping them get a new job, helping them get a haircut, work on their resume, kind of, you know, it's material transformation for others. And you help them and then they never forget it. They might help you years down the road because they've never forgotten the fact that when they were in a materially difficult circumstance, you helped them get back on their feet gave him a place to stay, gave him a haircut or, you know, however it is, pointed him in the right direction to a degree, which is also funny because you might think as an undefined G, um, how could I ever point anyone to anything? I'm really starting to see the undefined G center so differently now. Uh, really, it started when I, I went to Los Angeles with Von Paul, Von Paul, the artist. He has an undefined G center, but he showed me all the coolest places in L.A., and I realized, well, he's in his 70s, like he's learned so much. This is the wisdom of the undefined G. He's really learned every nook and cranny of that city. He knows it all so deeply and he knows he has such a refined sense. He's learned so much. It's, you know, it's only the kind of foolish undefined G that gets swept up in the homogenized um, kind of fan culture and stuff like that. Because you oftentimes will see a younger, you know, undefined G who is a bit of a caricature of a certain type of fan or a caricature of a certain, you know, an archetype or something of, oh, this is what a sports fan is like, or this is what they've just gotten so wrapped in up in it that their identity is so conditioned by the group they're a part of. And then you find someone who's older with an undefined G and they have such a unique identity. I mean, the places you showed me in Austin, same deal, you know. Um, I mean, I some found some of them independently and I would say, Hey Dave, is this cool? And you're like, yeah, I practically lived there for a number of years. I'm like, okay, it's cool. If Dave lived there, not literally, but. Oh, right. Like a uh, white horse. I yeah, exactly. Talking about. I, but that's Which I didn't, I didn't even think, go you know. in there that night. Yeah. Well, you've already been there. You've already done that. You know, you had the undefined G wisdom of, and the I was exactly like, I was done enough. That time, yeah. that part, like I, by the time I was like waiting for you guys to show up and I just was like done, I was like, I just want to go home. So that's what I did. Um, but I don't know. I have, I'll have these undefined G experiences where it's just my day off and I feel like I've got to go somewhere and I got to go there's something out there there's something at a place there's a person or a place that i got to go be somewhere and i'm just like not gonna be happy until i leave the house and go drive and park and walk around and then and then i end up standing somewhere and sort of like being dissatisfied or you know, and just being like sort of lost and like feeling like there's something missing. And like, I literally will just walk around aimlessly, stand and look at things like that. 
it's this no direction kind of feeling and like no identity it makes sense that they're the same thing you know mm -hmm. well i've heard a couple interesting um points from mike recently uh michael steenbeck litvin um uh, so he he really has some interesting points about the g center he had one the other day where he was saying if you're an undefined g you kind of fill up the camel hump and so if you're around somebody that you really like and you're filling up on their g center you get this sort of after effect of just being more charitable in what you like and you're watching a movie and you're like oh i kind of like that i don't mind it but if you're hanging out with somebody that you really just don't like and they're taking you to places you don't like and you're just going, why am I doing this? And so on. Then afterwards, you know, a new album comes out from your favorite band. You listen, you go, that's ah, not very good. I don't really like this very much. That there's almost like this afterglow of liking or disliking things. That's hmm. one interesting point. Then the other thing that he, he said in his observations is that you, if you really like somebody, you pretty much, it's very binary in that even if you don't like all the music they're into and even if you don't like all the books they're into and all the things they're into, you could learn to like them if you like that person. Whereas if you don't like somebody, they could be into the coolest stuff, but you're just gonna kinda not like it. And it's funny because, you know, somebody like that you really a spite like, somebody almost. You don't like. Yeah, or just kind of like yeah, like I don't want this person that I don't think is very cool to introduce me to something that I think is really cool now. Or, yeah. You know, it's kind of a funny, but I, but it's also just um, this whole idea of direction being towards. I mean, it's really it's love and direction. Things you like, things you love, and um, I guess the other point that he'd made. This was a couple of years ago now, but Mike pointed out um, drinking can really affect the G center. The G center is the liver. And so drinking a lot can make people feel a little bit aimless and almost need to recuperate by they've lost the ability to like a bunch of stuff. So the next day they just want to kind of sit on the couch and like play their favorite video game because it's almost like your favorite thing. You don't really need much energy to like. You can just like it even when you hate everything else. But then as the G Center gets healthier and better and in the healthy mm. locations and hangs out with people it really loves spending time with and goes to places it really enjoys being and all this stuff it kind of expands the sort of spiritual heart the spiritual heart muscle kind of works out to where it can handle liking and seeing what's cool about all this stuff that it otherwise you know the day after drinking it's like i don't have time for any of this i can't handle it today i can't like the small talk at the cafe i can't like this stupid tv show i can't like whereas when you kind of have this like boosted or kind of uh soaring spiritual heart vibe you're like oh, i can see what's nice about that oh i just had a great small talk conversation with this person oh i just you know you can kind of this classic sort of new sure. age trope of having your heart open something like that you know as opposed to fuck the world <laughs> Exactly. Like a, you know what I mean? Exactly. The exactly. World thing. <laughs> well, and then this is something that I kind of came up with last year because I kept getting questions about the difference in the nine centered form and the seven centered. And what I came up with is basically um, the seven centered has the sacral and the root and it has the head, ajna, and the throat. So it really does have the same basic, you know, these these five but the heart center split into the g and the ego kind of because mm -hmm. we call the ego the heart but the g center is also i was calling it just a minute ago the spiritual heart i mean it's kind of like mm -hmm. the higher self heart the lower self heart right. and uh and then meanwhile the solar plexus split into the solar plexus and the spleen because we didn't used to need to have such a big catalog of viruses and illnesses and so on as we all kind of moved into cities and became condensed and in other people's auras. It's a really interesting thing where you could take a cave person and drop them in Times Square, they would get diseases and die immediately. And yet they were so much hardier in certain ways and had a, such a stronger, healthier way of surviving, just not, it's kind of like, we are weaker in some sense, but we can handle more diseases because we have a bigger, it's a different priority. It's like uh, the form has changed 
to right. prioritize cities. And in so right. doing, we can't, we, we can't even fall over without hurting ourselves, but we can. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But they we can, can jump like, off of a waterfall. Go on a subway and like eat nachos with our unwashed hands and <laughs> Exactly. Know. Exactly. Yeah. So but I guess one interesting point of just that kind of thought of how did the seven center change to the the nine center? So I've been a fan of Carl Jung for so long. And one of the great narratives of Carl Jung is really a beautiful narrative that he gives, and I think it has to do with the G center and uh, the ego, the heart. And um, that narrative is, well, basically it's the narrative of what he calls individuation or psychic development. And I started thinking that the individuation process, the process of individual psychic development, I don't mean psychic in the sense of like palm reading, although we should talk about palm reading later. That would that'd have been into it. But um, I just mean psychic. Flavor the of the month. <laughs> yeah. People are getting sick of me uh, changing and going through each one. You know, I was into Mayan astrology for like three weeks. Like, No, but I, I loop back around to them. Uh, but in, in any case, um, you know, the, the, basically the psychic development of the individual, how the psyche develops, I realized that it's developing in a way that mirrors in the microcosm, the move from the seven to the nine centered being in the macrocosm. It's almost like how the fetus goes through a phase where it has the vestigial tail before it loses the tail and so on. In the psychic development of an individual, we kind of go through this phase where the, the ego and the G center are one. And what I mean by that is that as a child, we all kind of start with this inability to differentiate or, you know, we, we don't even know where we end and someone else begins. There's what Freud called oceanic narcissism, primary narcissism, not like a personality disorder narcissism, but just like how little babies feel like kings and gods and, you know, they feel like monarchs. Right. And so you don't develop makes... empathy for a lo quite a while and you just exactly like, don't realize that, yeah, if you're like, don't give a fuck if you're like hurting somebody or any, you just yeah. like, there's no concept of it. Exactly. And so then I was realizing that even as teenagers and going into adulthood, and this is kind of Jung's main premise, he says, uh, we have the capital S self, which is different from the little s self, which is more like the ego. And the capital S self is the name that he gives to the whole psyche, including the unconscious and including really the spirit and including all of these kind of like the capital S self is the psychic organizing principle. And what Jung says is we basically, as we learn language, as soon as we become speaking beings, we're cast into culpability, responsibility, guilt, interiority. This is where all of this neurosis comes from. We start becoming neurotic because basically at that point, we learn, yeah, like you're saying, we learn empathy. We learn that we're responsible for things. We learn that we can be guilty of something. We learn we have the superego, all this stuff. And that's kind of more like Freudian than Jungian per se. But what Jung's development is, is that as we individuate, as we differentiate as people, we become deeply alienated, alienated from ourselves. And we start to feel all alone in the world. And we start to feel sad and lost and unable to communicate with other people. And as this happens, it's basically, it's mirroring, I'm saying, the ego divesting itself from the self. It's like being cast off into the world where you're your own person, and but you're, but you're kind of exiled from the God principle, so to speak, uh, because the self would be more like our psychological image of a higher power. And so as we've seen, um, you know, Nietzsche's death of God and the enlightenment and all of these developments in consciousness that have really left us feeling very alienated from ourselves, that mirrors the heart center splitting into the G center and the ego, where the individual ego is now something separate and different. And it can't experience itself as united with or in union with. So dig it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you're saying as part of our life process, we go through a, 
not uh, not literal, but it's on some level transformation from seven centered to nine centered, like as being... yeah, we just experienced the same kind of movement where the seven centered being didn't have the same neuroses and the same questioning and the same. Do you make the same analogy with the spleen and the solar plexus? I actually haven't tried. I haven't thought about how that would work because I don't, I guess I'm not as familiar with what interesting, I guess how the solar plexus for the seven centered being was had a quite a different value. It wasn't really considered emotional. You know, it wasn't an emotional center. It's more of a power center. Um, so that's interesting. And also, I guess I would say that even the alienation that we experience didn't fully begin with the nine centered because in some ways that's also the narrative of the mind and mental control being alienated from nature itself. If we really go back to the five centered being as being in sort of harmony with nature. Yeah. I mean, the like the, these themes are like, they still exist. Like I've always made, wondered about this. Shakespeare, right? Do you ever get into Shakespeare? I love Shakespeare. Yeah. One of the greatest writers of all time. So no projectors in any Shakespeare. There's not a single projector in any Shakespeare play. Mm -hmm. There's not a single um, nine centered being. They're right. There's nothing right variable. Well, and right. And we were actually at the Austin meetup. We were talking uh, with that uh, gentleman who was saying he believed that the nine centered beings did appear before 1781 in some sense, right? But I but missed that me, one. Or, <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> I think it was just that at different key points in history, I, I think what it really was was the problem of how could a figure as big as Shakespeare or a figure as big as Jesus or a figure as big as Buddha or any of these historically notable figures, how could they be just seven centered? And I think we have to kind of decouple um, the consciousness from the um, we have to decouple the consciousness from the form, because in some ways, like a higher consciousness could embody in a seven centered form. Yeah, it can't be a projector. It could only it can't be right variable. It has certain limitations of the form, but there were still um, you know agents of a sort of futuristic at the time. Uh, you know, evolutionary strain that were helping mutate humanity, helping bring about new changes. Another intransitous type. Well, yeah, or just that it, not that the form was any different, but just that there's the mutative core. I think that's the missing piece here. Mm. The mutative core will always incarnate in whichever form it has available. And that mutative core is going to always bring about mutation and bring about the sort of bleeding edge of human evolution, regardless if it's in a five or a seven or a nine centered form. So obviously there are these really exceptional people like Shakespeare who were able to uh, bring about such incredible work that they were kind of avant-garde, you know, they were, you know, ahead of their time. Paving yeah, but the could way you, could you, -centered. has any, nobody has really looked at it though like maybe you could make the the point that there was that 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 is reflected in the literature that there's that there aren't projectors that there are that like that the emotional the way that emotions are framed are like different than they are now with i think like that's it, a wonderful no i agree entirely i think that is an incredible area but yeah because i don't think um that there were nine centered beings then. And I think as we understand the differences, I mean, that can actually help us understand right? some of those differences. Or all literature, you know, like, when, and what happens when the projector comes about, like what kind of new writing comes comes through? Because it's like really the only, the only way to study what the psychology of the, what the, the public psychology was at that point in time. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's uh, it kind of reminds me, um, let's take a short break, but, but when we come back, let's talk about uh, Julian Jaynes and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. He's a really fascinating thinker who I think is very relevant to the discussion of seven-centered and nine-centered and just the development of human consciousness. And um, 
let's uh let's take a short break and we'll be back soon <laughs> Recording in progress. Sorry, I missed that. What's up? Recording in progress. <laughs> recording in progress. We're recording. We're recording. No time to put on your headphones. And we're back. We're back. You know, you don't have to start recording like immediately. You could, you could wait a second. I just want to make sure I catch every little bit. Every of... little bit of jargon. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, all right. So we were just talking about the move from the seven to the nine centered being. Um, you brought up Shakespeare. Uh, it's interesting to look at these historical figures and to kind of see that there may have been a different consciousness expressed or that there may have been different limitations. Like you were saying, there's no projectors in Shakespeare. There's no right variable that the solar plexus has a different quality that the relationship to emotions was different in that right. time. Absolutely. And then I brought up, uh, there's a guy named Julian Jaynes who wrote The Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Really interesting thinker. And it's kind of a fringe text because... He makes some pretty outrageous claims. Uh, He essentially claims that what we would call sanity or consider to be like a sober, rational, sane, somewhat objective, somewhat neutral observer. I mean, obviously we know that we're all biased and there's all sorts of, you know, it's, we're not fully objective or anything, but just this sort of, uh, standard that we have of, uh, a somewhat or objectively uh, objective it, or, or just like yeah just like the the kind of contemporary standard of a relatively rational observer is so new that even what we would call sanity i mean what he basically claims is that um modern humans understand that the voice that they hear in their head is an inner monologue or an inner right dialogue. i heard that yeah. like back in the day like be, but people that was how you you had thoughts was literally a voice in your head like the people well, literally or, heard their their mind yeah. talking to the like i think we should i don't think i'll go over here right now like there would be a thing that went <laughs> well and, and even i mean the thing is you can still experience that i mean a lot of people have inner monologue of okay now i'm doing this doing that you know it's interesting well, some yeah but don't. you don't hear it like like as a yeah. sound Right, right. You know what it's, I mean? It was like it exactly. used to be like the way that we would would classify someone who's schizophrenic or something. Like I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the what. No, I, absolutely. Well, absolutely. If but somebody's still, hallucinating, they have auditory <clears throat> hallucinations. Yeah, auditory is the word that I wanted to use a minute ago. So, anyways, that well, used that's to be kind totally of, normal for people right, to like and hear. That's, their thoughts. That's what Julian James claims. So this is, you're probably familiar with it because what he claims has kind of gone out into the collective now. But before he made that claim, and even still, I mean, it's, there's no real agreement on that. I mean, he, what he was claiming was maybe even going a bit further, that people would hallucinate so much in the old days. There are all these customs of, for instance, like you mentioned Shakespeare. In Hamlet, there's the you know, there's talking to the skull. Well, that wasn't just some poetic thing that we interpreted as. It was that the skull was actually talking back. The person's actually hallucinating a conversation with the skull. And uh, he points to this, to all this evidence from different early civilizations of basically communication with the dead, communication with various spirits, and even just hearing the voice of God, which he claims uh, some people may have misunderstood basically that we developed this new faculty of having an inner voice. And as we developed that faculty, we misrecognized that voice as coming from without. And it took us a few thousand years to sort of 
Right. Become yeah, kind of to become what we would call sane in this in this sense. Oh shit. It all yeah. makes sense now. Yes. That's, well, it's that's hard. Awesome. I mean, it's it's an idea anyway, and I, I definitely enjoyed his book. I was like fourteen when I read it, and I thought, "Wow, this is this is crazy." But uh, um, but there's also uh, another crazy. interesting there's another interesting theory, which is that the color blue is actually yes. the newest color, and because you read Homer, and it's like the wine red sea, and people go, "I love that." that what? That, like, why story. would? Yeah, why would the, the radio be wine red? Radio Lab episode was what blew that up. Ah, okay, have you ever listened to that? I like Radio Lab. I have not listened to that particular oh, man. episode. Well, they That's had great. to like amend the episode several times, but like it was that was kind of their best episode ever. Just so mind blowing because yeah, it's like they don't you don't they go through um the order in which colors were mentioned in literature so black and white and then red came next and then i don't know red i mean orange and yellow and green but blue is the last one to come as wow. being mentioned in literature and um and it, all of those according to this episode all of those occurrences in literature also sort of corresponded with the ability to pro to pr reproduce the color artificially or mass produce it in textiles or dyes or as soon as there was an, a need to identify it in the with mm -hmm. their ability to produce it that was when it became necessary to, to come up with a word for it and to uh, have it be something that had to be distinguished even though I it see. should exist in nature otherwise but even still I, we come yeah. up with new colors that need new names well and it could exist in nature but maybe we didn't have the trichromes or the things you know to be able to see that color right. um or we just hadn't differentiated it i mean well, then they also like have yeah. like people who like they'll they'll take an ipad to like a native tribe in i don't know where somewhere where people live in the bush still and they'll it'll be like a bunch there'll be like 16 dots and they'll be like 15 of them are are green and then one of them's blue or like a different green like a bluish green and then they they can't tell which one's different they they have no idea which one stands out as a different color mm -hmm. and then yeah, those for them there's other ones that they can see and I think I'm not sure about that, but uh, like there was there was some other one that they were like it was real obvious to them, I think. But still, well, it's, it's just what it a matter shows, of awareness of it. Exactly, and I think that's something um, that I've been noticing. I've been learning palmistry, and it, when you get into palmistry, at first you kind of just look at the lines in the hand, and you don't really see in in high definition, so to speak. You, you see the lines, but you don't really, it's fascinating that even over the course of one or two weeks of just every day spending a few minutes doing palmistry, looking at hands and so on, you, you really do learn to read the hands in the sense that you notice so much more. Like when I first looked at my hands, I was like, okay, there's a line here, there's a line here. Okay, there's a line, a line. Now I see like 800 lines, you know what I mean? And I can actually make out these sort of different well, I mean, not that they're all significant. There's still the main lines and there's still, um, but it's it's kind of like that. There's I lines remember getting within the lines. You've got to look <laughs> I, deeper, man. you got to look between. I mean, I do that too. And then there's more lines. So, but I, I remember like when a, I first got into. There's, there's like a fractal, yeah. like never ending, like going into the palm it, thing. It kind of feels Jonah that way. Like just spinning around and. Well, it feels like when you're looking palm at the palm, like your palm is so small, and by the end of it, it kind of makes a big Maybe map. Maybe yours is. <laughs> no, it's it's more, it's more that similar to how a body graph is a map. When I first kind of do human design, thinking, how am I ever going to learn these sixty-four hexagrams, these sixty-four gates? But it's kind of like you move to a city. You don't think, how am I ever going to learn how to drive around the city? You just drive around the city. Pretty soon, mm. you just know where everything is. You would know where at least 64 landmarks are in Austin. You know where at least 
64 streets are and so on. You just start to learn them because it's a map. It's like learning the 50 states, you know, or learning any any map because it's it's placed visually and it's relative, they're relative to each other, it's so much easier. So with palmistry, you know, your hand is a map. And when you first look at it, you're like, how am I ever, you know, okay, well, I have, okay, a fate line, I have a heart line, I have a headline and so on. And you kind of start to learn these very basic, I guess you could call them like the highways of, of the hand, you know, the big main arterials. But then you start to see so much more. You start to, it's really amazing how, how much emerges. It's kind of like if you just look at something long enough and you start we to don't see all even... these have to go to there i mean we could stay in human design with this one because like the centers is like the kind of that's just like the colors like the not knowing that blue was a color until somebody told you about blue and now it's like wait look yeah the whole fucking sky is blue like i didn't you, you, never... you can't unsee it right exactly right. once you've seen but it it's like you're permanently your tra your awareness is transformed right and to Absolutely. Think that, like, you know, I definitely never would have, I might have had some sense of different energy centers or something because, you know, people talk about chakras and you, you have like a sense of like a gut reaction to something as opposed to mental blah, blah, blah. But to know that there's two centers up here and like that there's, there is a difference between the G center and the, the ego because a lot of people are coming from chakra land and like almost, you know, almost figuring, figuring it out and then coming to human design and be like, oh, that's two things. And then like, then you start looking at it that way. And then you start being sensitive to the nuances of it and being aware. And it's like, that's, that's like finding new colors, you know? So here's, this is a perfect segue. I do want to return to palmistry because I'm just kind of curious. Right, because the talk, same but, thing to nerd out on. <laughs> but this is a nice uh, little segue into a comment, which uh, is from a YouTuber um, or a, a commenter on my YouTube, Atmaram. And Atmaram said something really, really fascinating. This was just about two weeks ago. And it was in the conversation about no choice. It may have, it was either on our video or it could have been on my video with Mark Germain, but I've been talking quite a bit about no choice lately. Um, it's an old favorite subject of mine because I don't think it simply means the same thing as uh, predeterminism or as fatalism or as causal determinism. In, in other words, um, I don't think it just means Laplace's demon, where, you know, Laplace uh, had this thought experiment where he said, if you knew the exact, the exact atomic configuration of every atom in the whole universe, and you could take a snapshot of it, you could press play, and it would play out the exact same way every time, because everything is a mechanical sort of uh, predetermined fatalist kind of, it's just pressing play on a video and the video plays. Because if you knew the position of every single atom, there's no way that those atoms could not decompose in the same way and could not, you know, they will always, well, we now know this is not true. With the discovery of quantum physics, we've learned actually, no, there is quantum indeterminacy, there is superposition, and there's quantum waveform collapse. The only way Laplace's demon would be true is if there's a sort of many worlds, uh, if that theory is real, if Everett's many worlds was real, which would mean that there's a near infinite amount of worlds. And so every quantum waveform collapse produces every possible outcome. But that to me is absurd. I'm not a many worlds theorist. I do think when people really are talking about, about this. Yeah, yeah, well, and I do think that when people talk about uh, different timelines and timeline jumping and stuff like that. They're talking about something in the quantum reality that we exist in that they explain as many worlds, choosing what world you're going to be in or jumping to a different timeline, a different world and so on. I don't think it actually is many worlds. What I think that is, is just talking about manipulating quantum waveform collapse. But um, I guess my point here is just, there's this wonderful comment from Atmaram, and I think it really relates to what you were saying about how 
when you become aware of something, you kind of can't unsee it. You, you become aware of the different centers and suddenly you're like, oh, okay, we have two centers in the head. We have the head and the ajna. They're different. I can experience the difference between them. You know, we do have a G center different from the ego. I can feel when my ego flares up. It's different than the alienation and ennui and, and existential crisis of the G center. You know, these are kind of different centers or like how Ra in his encounter with the voice during his eight-day encounter, at one point heard all nine of his centers talking. They each had a different personality, and they were all talking to each other. Oh, my God. It's Herman's head for human design. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's, so that's, here's, uh, yeah. yeah that sounds, that's great. That's a sketch comedy. Or, 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 or my favorite. Did you ever watch Mr. Show with Bob and Dave? Of course. Uh, Bob Odenkirk and David Cross. So yeah. they, had a, they had a great one where there's... Um, different people talking to this guy on the on the uh subway and they're like it's like an old woman and uh you know gay guy and a you know japanese man and and a biker and they're all talking to him and giving him different advice and they're telling him what he should do about his relationship you got to just go for it and get her no no you did the right thing and you know, all this stuff and then bob odenkirk comes out and he goes uh it's either Bob or Dave, I forget which one, and he's the, he's the uh, doctor. And it kind of is like, and scene, and he comes out and he's like, hi, I have a new book. Biker, gay guy, Japanese man, and old woman. These are the voices in your head that will help, you know, help you navigate your life. And then Dave comes out and it's like, scene, and it's like, I have a new book. Biker, gay guy, Japanese man, old woman, and the fake doctor. These are the five voices in your head. I'm the real doctor. That's, that's the manifesting generator. <laughs> the, the fake yeah the, the fake fifth so anyway okay so here's the text from atmaram he writes i feel i have cracked no choice my eyes lit up when i saw that i feel i have cracked no choice like he figured it out all right first of all yeah right pretty off to a good start first of all scientists have put electrodes inside people's brains and triggered them to lift up an arm then they asked them why they lifted their arms, and everyone had a reason. The neocortex makes up a narrative about everything we do a split second after we started doing it. We're in a delusional state where we take credit for something we're not doing at all. This is true, no choice. But of course, at the same time, we all have changed our lives, be it with human design or other systems. We've all had that experience, and we know we do have a choice somehow somehow right that there's something there's something that you know beyond just attributing uh so anyway here's what he writes he says the answer came for him from one of the non-dual masters nisargadatta nisargadatta and nisargadatta uh, and by the way advaita vedanta also claims no choice no free will whatsoever but nisargadatta said understanding acts not like we're understanding acts but understanding itself understanding acts so it's not like you're on a plane with the destination set where you can only choose things which will have no impact on where you end up it's exactly the other way around you can't even blink an eye not even that freedom and yet when you see things your understanding changes and that changes everything and you're steering the plane while not blinking your own eyelids. I love that, that you're steering the plane through the understanding changing, even though you can't even control the blinking of eyes or what you do at any point. Mm. This is what human design gives you, a new understanding. Your awareness opens up. You get your nervous system and your senses in tune. Your understanding of the Maya explodes, and that changes everything. We're here to watch the movie, but some people don't get it. We can get the movie, and our understanding writes the story. So if we get it, that itself changes our trajectory, the act of understanding or the act of getting it. Dang. Pretty good, right? Pretty, yeah. pretty deep. So, right. yeah. Who when is I, this person? Atmaram. Yeah. If you're watching Atmaram, please post any post another comment because your first one's pretty amazing no that's not his first one he's posted a few times and i i really um uh, i really enjoy what he has to this say this is a youtuber well he's a youtube commenter 
So he's just a commenter on the YouTube. So, um, but yeah, I'd love to, if you're watching at Rome, I'd love to have you as a guest and we could talk about no choice and anything else that comes up. Uh, you can email me jdempsey with a C at gmail.com, J-D-E-M-P-C-Y at gmail.com. So I'd like to see that. But yeah, I, I really liked that. I mean, I can't say that I, I fully understand it, but just... I kind of could see how that could work. I love how he says, it's not that we have some very limited choice. We can't control the destination of the plane, but we can like move around in the seats. It's actually the other way around. We can't even move around in the seats. We can't even control blinking our eye. But when our understanding changes, the plane just automatically starts going somewhere else. Kind of an interesting idea. Like we can't force it to change, but as our awareness changes, the navigation itself changes that the awareness is the navigational system or maybe the navigation just pretty much stays the same anyways but we just perceive it differently we perceive it through the lens of our understanding or something mm. right right i mean maybe it would have it's interesting to think about though i, I just like that quote from nisargada nisargadatta rather uh which is understanding acts that understanding itself takes understanding some action. Understanding does act. Yes. Yeah. By understanding something, an action occurs. And that's kind of an interesting idea because we tend to think of understanding as purely passive, as no action taking place, nothing really changed. But what if, I mean, this Similar is like to quantum observation. physics. Right. Yeah, In quantum exactly. physics, you observe something, the quantum waveform collapses. That's that's what I'm getting at. And, yeah, uh, yeah, totally. And that's why Dang. I don't like. Am right? Isn't it pretty cool? Dang. It's a pretty cool idea. All right, all right, everybody, think about that for your homework. Okay, so how about um, a little intro to palmistry? Because that's what I've been enjoying so much. Yes, yeah, so let's and... just do the palmistry thing. Here you go. Here's mine. <laughs> well, that's your left hand. Are you left-handed? No. Are you are you ambidextrous? You're right handed. Okay, let's, let's do you right like hand. To, let's, right. Okay, let's see. Hold let's on. see. I got to make it a little bit. Well, then I'll turn the lights up. Yeah, you have pretty clearly defined lines. So the the way I wow, you have some really you have a very defined Mercury line. Wow, you have an yeah. extremely like that's like the deepest Mercury line I've ever seen. That's okay. incredible. The Mercury line is uh, the one coming off down off your pinky. So the four main lines that people look at, yeah, yeah, there's a line, a very strong Mercury line there. That's that's very rare and uh, probably shows a very brilliant mercurial nature. So the Earth line is the one closest to your thumb. So um, when you're looking at the Earth line, like here's my Earth line. You can see you have a pretty defined, pretty deep earth line. And your earth line goes decently far from your thumb. So if your if your earth line, it's okay. You can I'll just explain that and you can kind of and those at home can look at look at their own and just a little bit of an intro. So the earth line is coming usually from around here and it goes down and around the thumb. And the closer it is to the thumb, these are people who really stay close to home and they don't really venture out into the world. They don't want to put themselves out into the world. They definitely don't want to be on a world stage or a public persona or anything like that. And so even though you are a 5'2", which traditionally wants to kind of hide out at home and so on, you do have a pretty, your, your earth line goes pretty far out into the world. For you, it kind of goes out like this. Um, mine's going pretty far out too. It's hard to see because I don't have a very strong earth line. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes people who have more mystical connection and or health issues have a weaker <laughs> earth line or just like aren't, aren't used to like hard work in the garden and stuff like that. But one of the interesting things just for those at home who want to look at their earth line. So look at the line that starts here in your hand. And if it kind of goes very close to the thumb, that tends to be a more retiring, withdrawing nature. If it goes further away from the thumb and deeper out towards the middle of the hand, these are people who don't mind going out in the world, being out in the world. 
Now, the fate line comes up from the middle of the hand. Like, here's my fate line. You had a pretty strong fate line as well that comes up right from the middle. Yeah, you can see that fate line. Well, interestingly, your earth line goes so far me, out. Like, well, your earth line. This when you tell me I'm about to line. die. What? <laughs> No, your, your earth line kind of meets your fate line. So you also see that where people have a, a fate that coincides with their life, like their personal life and what's personal to them it has so much to do with their sort of mission or purpose, what we would call a purpose. Like in human design, that would be your incarnation cross and your profile and so on. Um, and then there's the two lines here. So there's the top line, it's called the water line or the heart line, and then there's the head line. And so let's see let's see yours again, the, the top two, the kind of horizontal lines. All right, so yeah, you, you have, uh, they're not, well, they're decently strong. I mean, the first question, wow, you have such yep. a strong mercury line just cutting through them though. I mean, that's, your mercury line is actually, that's that line you have coming down here. That that's actually dimple. deeper. Yeah, it's like, it's like, like a- a mercury dimple. It's an extremely strong mercury line. It's I'm just really dehydrated or something. Is probably <laughs> no, no. People don't. I mean, I have a mercury line. It's kind of hard to see, but I actually do. Um, I have a mercury line. You're talking line about there. this That's, jiggy right here, yeah, though, right? Yeah, That's exactly. Like, That's the mercury line. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. yeah, I got that. I got one of those. And then you have your heart and your headline. And so you can tell a lot about your thinking and your emotional state. Those when are, the, are you going to blow my mind? <laughs> well, just that, uh, you know, it's just, I'm just kind of giving an intro. So they're both pretty strong. They're both pretty strong for you. They're not as strong as your Mercury line. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's going to be more about, this is just a little intro. We won't go too much deeper than this for now, but just those four lines are a good place to start. The earth line is sort of your physical line. Um, the fate line, I think it's also called the Mars line. I'm not positive, but it's the it's kind of like how you are in the world stage. Then you have the water and or the heart and the head line. And so someone who has a very deep heart line, for instance, um, like I have a decently deep heart line. That's my that's this line right here. When you have a deep heart line, it just signifies feeling deeply that you just have a strong depth of feeling. And you can tell a lot of things about it. I mean, if it if it's chained or if it has uh, tassels or if it has a lot of lines cutting across it, that could be a lot of hardships in areas of love and romance. Um, is mine, is it that, that like across the oh. top one? Or do I not have one? <laughs> yeah, no, it absolutely is. No, 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 no. It's across the top. And you also have a very strong... Um, it's the Jupiter line. Your Jupiter line is so strong. That that line coming from your ring finger, you have a really strong Mercury line and a really strong Jupiter line. So yeah, I'm still kind of a newbie to palmistry. Uh, I just want to give a little intro overview so people at home can kind of start, start there, start looking at those four lines I mentioned. Even just at a basic, when you look at your hand, which of those four is the strongest? Like for me, my strongest is my heart line. I have a very strong heart line. And so because my I have a strong heart line, I tend to make decisions from the heart. And I mean, I know I'm supposed to, I'm a sacral decision maker. I mean, I'm a, you know, sacral generator. So following strategy and authority, it's it's waiting for my sacral to decide. But still, it it tends to decide what um, you know, fits well with my kind of emotional nature and my my heart and so on. Uh, and then whereas somebody who has a very strong lifeline or earth line, as it's called, would be very physical oriented. And it's almost like what we would say is like splenic versus ajna versus solar plexus. Like the splenic is kind of physical. The ajna is very mental. The solar plexus is very emotional in some sense. So it almost relates to that. Um, but yeah, it's a really fascinating system. And if there's anyone uh, who's watching and wants to comment on palmistry, any favorite books, resources to check out, any comments on Dave or my palms, <laughs> I'm happy to hear them. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of something I've been learning a lot about. I have a um, good friend who's been kind of teaching me. And I always like, it, that, that's that first line in me. You know, I'm always looking for someone to teach and I'm always looking for someone to teach me. So. The palm reading definitely always is a big hit at, dinner parties and stuff like that 
Absolutely. Absolutely. We did a gathering of mystics just the other night, um, just this past Saturday here in Santa Fe. And um, we did Enneagram, Tarot, human design, and palmistry. And palmistry was by far the biggest hit. So. Okay. Well, um, how about, uh, let's see. So my other favorite pastime recently has been Cards of the Magi. I don't want to totally derail into Cards of the Magi, but I did get a new book on it. I'm pretty excited. I'll just show uh, viewers. This was the book that I've been working from, which is one of my favorites. And uh, I brought this with me to Austin and I was carrying it around with me everywhere to all the, all the bars and doing. And then I just got uh, this one, which is another one. Um, the hidden and deeper meanings of the cards and the time-based spreads. And so this one has been really interesting for me because I've been kind of going deeper in trying to understand, um, you know, in Ra's encounter with the voice, he asked the voice about the cards, specifically tarot cards, but tarot does include basically what I'm studying here as cards of destiny. And the voice said that they were sequences, specifically incarnation sequencing. And I just really like um, this idea of there being these hidden sequences that we can kind of explore and investigate. I mean, I'm a first line, you know, what can I say? I love investigating the mysteries of the world. And it, so anything that has this kind of sequence is just very interesting to me. Not using the cards, like drawing a card or doing a spread to kind of answer a question, not for a query, you know, not for divination but just understanding the different sequences of the cards and sort of seeing these hidden sequences in the world. It's just fascinating to me. I, I love that kind of thing. I mean, um, just last week, uh, I was doing yard work here with a, a, a you know friend of a friend. He's only born seven days apart from me, same year. Or he's born, let's see. No, he's born like... October 4th, I'm September 25th. So what is that? That's uh, nine days apart. We're both born the same year. We're both born in 1983. So I always am looking for interesting parallels when I when I meet someone who's born really close to me. You know, are they part of the same sequence of events or the same cohort or something? Well, we got to talking and it turns out he lived in and actually did a lot of housework on... Um, the first place I lived when I moved to Santa Fe. I moved to a house in Don Juan, right by Alto, by the by the river in Santa Fe. And, you know, I moved in in 2018, 2017, maybe, I think it's 2018. And he moved out a few years prior. But I just love that of all the places in all of Santa Fe, tens of thousands of possible places to live. We just happen to live in the exact same place. You know, those kind of things. Or I've hosted some events here and I had someone come here who grew up here in this house. I, I love that kind of thing, these synchronicities that happen. But I guess I'm just saying that those are kind of the hidden sequences, that there's these sequences of events. Have you ever met any any type or any, um, any doppelganger, any human design astro doppelgangers of yourself, anyone born within a few days of you? Anything like that or not exactly. I mean there's every there's a I was born during a at least a couple of weeks, few weeks of manifestors being born, like really? emotional manifestors. And so I have I have a friend from high school who's also like was was is a February twenty eighth, uh and March twelfth, but he's still got he's the 3536 manifester with a 3740 and then and we were like besties i mean uh, that's only 12 days apart same year right and then we had another friend um who was a another pisces i think she was like a um march 6th or something yeah, so that's only six days apart i mean i always love <clears throat> comparing how your life trajectory has gone 
I remember when I started doing human design catalyst here in Santa Fe, we had a guest, um, you know, people hear about it and they, they kind of come and I said, okay, well, let's do your chart. When were you born? And she said, uh, 925, 1983. And I said, no, that's my birthday. When's your birthday? She goes, no, that's my birthday. Uh, she's a, she's a four or six. So she was born, um, eight hours before me. And, uh, what's interesting is we both bought our first homes so my first home is now the center for for you know human design, but we bought our first homes within a month of each other, closed on the house. We both been looking for a year and mm. a very parallel trajectory of like buying our home the same. I mean, th that kind of thing I just love. I mean, I love seeing these so sequencing commonalities. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we've we've talked about this before publicly and privately, and I just I still can only sort of like it only it doesn't really make sense to me how that is any sort of practical thing yeah I, I mean is, there's or how you would even look at it or how, what kind of sense you might make of anything it just doesn't make any sense to me well i'll tell you what let's take a short break when we come back let's read um either your or my spread for the year and I'll grab the spreads book and we'll use Cartus Espiritus because, you know, there's two meanings to sequencing. There's incarnation sequencing, which is what Ra talked about. Very hard to make practical use of that because that's kind of the sequence of profiles you come in as. Like I'm a 5-1 this <clears throat> life. Would that mean that I'm like a 1-3 next life and then a 3-5 the life after that? Or you're a five two. Would you be a two four next life, and then a four six? Like, is there kind but of? But no, it's chain? not that because that doesn't require a fucking whole deck of cards to <laughs> to represent. Right, right. But it yeah. well, it, it doesn't. So it doesn't. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. well, but also there's this within the life. It's kind of like a fractal uh, repetition. So, not really talking about past lives, future lives, any of that. Just within the life. Can the cards tell you something interesting about that year of your life? So let's just take a short break and then we'll just take a look. We can get to other topics as well. This can just be a little, okay. uh, little cool. side topic. science of the cards so i'm looking at the grand solar spreads from sharon jeffers and i'm going to be referencing robert lee camp the uh, grand master of the order of the magi in his book cartus espiritus which is my newest acquisition in this uh this area cartus espiritus. so uh yeah, exactly. We need Cartus. bells, like the yeah. church bells in the background. So okay. uh, here is a spread. Um, this is your annual spread. And so anybody who wants to find their annual spread, go to knowyourdestinycards.com. Knowyourdestinycards.com. And you go to their solar quadration charts. Uh, it's a very technical name, but basically... Quadration is a way of you you put the deck of cards through an operation and it kind of comes out looking random. It's not random. It just looks that way. Um, but you get quadrations for each year. And it, it eventually starts over if you do it enough times. If you get to 89, you get back to the, to the first one. Uh, but the idea is that it gives you your chart for the year basically your sequence for the year so you know how we were talking about sequencing and you know this looks like a totally random sequence you know what does ace of spades have to do with four of diamonds or nine of hearts or you know but they actually are um it actually is it actually is very interesting it, it is these are like sequences yeah yeah you get these sequences and there's only 89 of them or I guess 90, because one's the spirit spread. So you get like 90, 89 or 90 sequences, and they can tell you different things. And the two main ones that are used are the, um, let me just for a second here, 
the grand life spread and the grand spirit spread. And the grand spirit spread is said to be before you were born. And then the grand life spread is when you're zero years old. And then you can see that when you're one year old, you get a new spread. And when you're two years old, you get a new spread and three years old and so on. And you get spreads for each year of your life up until 89. Um, I keep going and then it just starts over. Yeah, so 89 is identical with the spirit spread. And then it just starts over where 90 is identical to zero. So this, this is the same as the very first, first spread. And it can tell you all sorts of interesting things, and I'm kind of learning it. I mean, it's definitely um, a very deep system. Uh, for anyone really genuinely interested in learning, I recommend the book by Olney Richmond, The Mystic Test Book, also translated as The Mystic Textbook. Um, I guess test book was the original way of spelling textbook. Kind of funny, right? Textbook is a little bit you know, redundant anyway. Right. All books have text. So uh, what we call, I guess not all, not picture books, but what we, what we call textbooks were originally called test books because they were books for learning, for tests and so on. And uh, so if you look up the mystic test book, um, it's actually online for free. You can, you can find it for free and it's, it's a really good, it's not copyrighted. So, okay, let's just see what we can find. So your card is your birth card is the Jack of Diamonds. And already, I mean, I guess maybe just to start with context, we should just read a little bit about the Jack of Diamonds. So I'm using uh, this great Exploring the Little Book of the Seven Thunders by Robert Lee Camp. This is a, a great reference book. And there we go, turn to the Jack of Diamonds. Not bad. The Jack of Diamonds has a lot of Neptune and Uranus energies. This creates someone who prides themselves on being unique. Pride is the key word here. All jacks, queens, and kings have an excess of it. The jack of diamonds person may be deluded about what is really going on in their life. If they're unsuccessful, as many are, they never imagine it's because something they are doing. The uh, Uranus-Neptune position of their birth card and the life spread can sometimes be too much for one mind to handle. First of all, their personal freedom is something they worship and hold in high regard like a statue upon the altar of God. This idealization, Neptune, of the importance of their freedom becomes the reason or excuse to do many things that cause them to end up denying happiness and success that they seek. All the cards who have strong freedom urges also have difficulty with responsibility and commitment. And it goes on, but uh, you, you get some idea of kind of the Jack energy is this free-spirited, freedom-loving. I mean, if you understand astrology and the, the archetypal astro astrological archetypes, you can see it's uh, Uranus with Neptune. So eccentricity with mysticism and dreaminess and intuition and, and a lot of things like that. The Neptune energy applies in most every area of their life. If you will look you will notice that every life spread card from Mercury through Neptune is in the Neptune row. So, I mean, I'm a very Neptunian person too. I'm a queen of hearts, which is the double Neptune card. So if there's anyone even more, you know, out in the, in the Neptune sense, it's probably me. And that is also your, uh, yeah, I'm, your planetary I'm, 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 card. Got Pisces. Pisces is Neptune, right? Right, and that's also why your planetary ruling card is the Queen of Hearts, which is which is my card. So okay. also my Mercury so just, and my Venus also Pisces. Ah, well, um, you know, Mercury and Pisces is a great poet, very poetic. It is the detriment, or maybe even the fall. I can't recall, but uh, but I always like Mercury and Pisces. It's you find it in a lot of really poetic speakers, and. Um, and then, of course, Venus. Yep. <laughs> Got your Mercury line. There's your Mercury temple. And then, uh, and then Venus in, in Pisces is, of course, the exaltation. So, okay. So this is for, this is for this year, starting at your birthday. And we see that you're in the 10 of spades position. 
What's interesting is most of the cards move into different positions. Um, the fixed and the semi-fixed cards don't, but the other 45 cards spend each year moving to a, you know, one position or the other. So you kind of get to experience what life would be like from the position of different cards. And in this case, uh, the, you're in the position of the Ten of Spades this year. Now it's also, you can think about it kind of like in Monopoly where you have to pay rent by being in a space on the board. You also have a card that's in your space. This is your traditional home. You kind of own this space on the board. See, Neptune, uh, Uranus. You own this Neptune, Uranus position. And the five of hearts is what's supporting you this year. It's paying you rent. It's basically giving you what it has to give free of charge. But then your, this would be kind of the position you're in is where you're going to school this year. Kind of like the openness in the chart and you know human design this would be this would be the openness this would be where you're learning mercury jupiter uh yeah exactly mercury and jupiter so if you've That's ever known crazy. a ten of spades person yeah if so, you ever know a ten of spades person you'll see they never do anything in a small way <clears throat> go on yeah uh, but this year I, you're learning to go big you're learning go big or go home this year you know you're learning you're learning to pay to bigness in the sense all tens are very you know ten is kind of the success card it's the winning card it's it's this is a year where you're kind of learning to really go big and learning learning how to spend your energy on yeah if you ever known a ten of spades person you will see that they never do anything in a small way if they decide to go for something they go all out and they seek to do it so well and so complete that there is really nothing more to add to their accomplishment, for better or worse. Uh, Camp writes, he says better or worse because he knew one ten of spades who decided to be the world's greatest alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And he was fairly successful. But what is beautiful about someone who goes all the way in either direction is that when he was done, he was done. It was over because he had given it everything he had. If only we are able to do that in many areas of our life, we could get the entire experience and then be complete with it, never having to repeat that again. So, yeah, this is, uh, so Camp mentions that only rich men speaks of the symbolism of the tens as being in the space in the center. So you can kind of see there's a 10, it's actually with us being in the space in the center. We're right here, we're right in the middle of it. And so, so what is it to be that space in the center? In the case of the, and it's surrounded by success on all sides. Well, in the case of the Ten of Spades, it's being surrounded by things to do on all sides. Because if you learn hearts are about love, clubs are about the intellect and mind, diamonds are about money and material and so on. And then you learn spades are about work, right? <laughs> So there's a lot of work to do, is, is kind of the theme here. The Ten of Spades is the biggest workaholic card in the deck. It's like a 10-cylinder engine with all the pistons working. But we are the ones doing the work. So, yeah, so that's kind of the position you're in. It's like, what happens when you give to work? What happens when... You know, you're, you're finding yourself in the position that the Ten of Spades is in their whole lives. You're just a visitor there for this year. And that started in February, of course, for you. So we're still very early in the year. It'll be interesting to see how the next nine months unfold. Now, meanwhile, you're being supported. It's kind of like this is your goal. Your goal is to do as much work as possible, Ten of Spades. You're being supported by the Five of Hearts in doing this. So the Five of Hearts is what's what's helping you every step of the way. So after the experience of stability and security offered by the four of hearts, the addition of a one brings us to the five of hearts. All fives regard the stability and security of the four as a limitation on their freedom. That home or relationship that provided stability now becomes something to be avoided. It's old news, it's not any interest at all. Instead, now the person seeks to branch out and go exploring. Adventure awaits the five, and anything or anyone that stands in, the, in their way is simply ignored. 
This naturally implies change and often travel, sometimes experimentation, as it is new experiences that the five seeks most. When someone has a five of hearts appearing in their spread, they're reaching out for a new experience. It can be uh, changes in love, it can be travel, uh, it can be expanding one circle of acquaintances. And this isn't the goal this year. This is just something that's supporting you, that's helping you. It's something you get for free. Just like this is what's costing you a lot of money to learn how to do, this is something you're getting totally for free that's just supporting you in this year. Now let's look at the spreads. So here you are, and we can see you have Mercury. Uh, is nine of diamonds. This is your Mercury card. The way the spreads work is you start counting. Uh, this is your sun, and then this is the moon. And from the sun, you go Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and so on. Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And then the final card in the annual spread is the Pluto result, or the cosmic reward card kind of an octave of Jupiter. This is what you achieve if you've made it through the personal transformation of Pluto, of, of what it requires from you. Any comments, Any anything so far? Is it, yeah. It all, you know, it, it, I could easily make sense of all of it. Um, and I don't want to like speculate too much on how it could, you know, manifest. Yeah, I mean, this is, Right, it's only like three months into the year, so it's almost nicer to look at the previous year. I know that the sound of a lot of work to do isn't especially appealing, but yeah, I get it. I mean, if that uh, means like me getting a lot of the kind of work that I'd like to get and getting experience, well, yeah, doing and success. It, I mean, it's great. learning how to achieve. Right, learning how to great. achieve that success. Yeah. So okay, so your Mercury card is the Nine of Diamonds. Nines represent the end of the cycle. But is that ending a welcomed one or a disappointment or tragedy? So this is kind of the question. It is as if we think we actually know what is best for us, but it's a trick of our ego that we resist endings. Everything ends. He writes, as a friend of his once said, no one gets out of here alive. Our lives are full of beginnings and endings. Just watch the water on the beach. The tide goes in and out. By the way, uh, Robert Camp, who wrote this, He's a reflector. Interesting that he likes the tides and he's a very, uh, he does have a very um, kind of at one with the flow of the cosmos attitude. So you so, got, you just like went ahead and just went full on fortune teller, like dumping on you like, oh yeah, big changes this year. Things you don't think you can deal with. <laughs> It's going well, to seem like a tragic ending to so your whole life is going to change. It's going to fuck. Everything's going to be fucked up. Like, get ready. This is it. This but it's is all everything. about the perspective. It's all about the perspective. No, no, no. I mean, nine of diamonds end a cycle. So, I mean, it's. I guess it's just asking to kind of think about what is ending. And with nine of diamonds, um, that can be kind of the yard sale. It's kind of the yard sale card. It's something that was very valuable. I mean, it's usually about money or it's about material possessions, something you put a lot of money into, you're selling for cheap or... Uh... My fucking house. You're telling me I'm going to lose my house this year. No, 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 definitely not. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely not. That would not, that would definitely not happen. Uh, especially All right. not if we... God damn it. It's like my worst fear. This guy says that right. his nine of diamonds as a long range card was a year that he actually uh, purchased an airplane and there was no financial loss. So he's trying to say that it's not about, it's the end of a cycle. So the nine of diamonds appears when we are attached to something that's not good for us. So he's kind of saying it's not about true financial loss. It can be, and he even says uh, it's human nature to fear losing something that is valuable. Um, but yeah, the nine is the end of the cycle. It's possible to welcome all nines, but the truth is all nines are good. All losses are good, but it takes a person who's aware of the cost of personal attachments to realize this. So the nine of diamonds, as well as other nines can bring things one has wanted for a long, long time. It can mean a pleasant and wonderful graduation, 
like the end of wanting something. So. Okay. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one. So. No, it's just um, you know. I don't mind nine of diamonds. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are nine of diamonds. I have eight of diamonds as a planetary ruling card. So nine of diamonds has a sun relationship to my ruling card. And so I'm kind of, I'm partial to the nines. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really just an end of some sort of attachment. Now, king of diamonds, it's really hard to complain when you get kings in a, in a spread. I mean, this gives us a lot of power. Kings are the epitome of power and authority. And with power comes responsibility. The King of Diamonds is probably the second most powerful card in the deck. Just Why are we talking about King of Diamonds right now? Because this is, is also this? in your spread. This is your Venus card this year. So this is one of your one of your positive cards. Kings are leadership and imply taking the role of the leader. Uh, of course, your innocence, so that'll be an interesting <laughs> Interesting way of being a leader, but you are in many ways. I mean, you're at least um, a pillar of the Austin human design community and the human design community at large, and your, your contributions to human design worldwide are quite unique. I mean, I don't think anyone's done the level of avant-garde creative content you've done. Uh, and so to access the power of the King of Diamonds, one has to be ruthless in the pursuit of their goals which is not hard to do when we realize the buck stops with us. The appearance of the King of Diamonds in your spreads can mean it's time to wake up and take the reins of your financial success. It's the archetype of the successful business person. Bill Gates, King of Diamonds, planetary ruling card. Um, he had the reputation of being completely ruthless in his rise to the top. Many have forgotten how he stole ideas from others and completely destroyed other companies. It's a one-eyed king. Uh, so the one-eyed king has an incredible focus on one thing and one thing only, getting what they want. If you look in the life spread, you'll see that eight of clubs in Saturn. It's another very dominant card. And so for many, this implies having your own business. For many clients, the appearance of the king of diamonds is a signpost that says, start your own business now. It's time for them to step out of their regular job and start something on their own. This can be true regardless of the suit of the person's birth and ruling cards. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really um, the, the responsibility aspect of the kings is what often keeps people from realizing the success that the king offers. If a person is used to having excuses for lack of success or blaming their situation on the economy or forces outside themselves, they won't get much from this card. The king of diamonds implies it's all up to us. It gives us the power, the power to accomplish many great things. Uh, of course, the King of Diamonds could also symbolize having interactions with such a king. Interactions with someone of the diamond suit, perhaps, or someone who is older, experienced, and successful. The King of Diamonds is the mature, successful business person. The birth and ruling card people who should be especially aware of the appearance of King of Diamonds are, oh, I see. It's kind of saying that for certain cards, it's very significant. Uh, so in any case, yeah, I mean, this is really just, it's kind of, it is like divination. It is like fortune telling a little bit, but what it can show you is that your position this year, you know, you're seeing the world from the, the cockpit of the 10 of spades with work to do everywhere. And you're being supported by the five of hearts. Travel can be very supportive of you this year. New friendships, new connections, new networks. Nine of diamonds is asking to let go of certain things. King of diamonds is saying, hey, you can be really successful this year. So we'll just do a couple okay. more. Um, I mean, or we'll kind of, I'll speed them up a little bit so we don't take, take too long. So two of spades, the twos, the twos are about people working together. So twos are just about collaboration in general. Two of hearts is like classic marriage card. Two of spades, because it's spades are work, it's about working together. And this is your Mars card. Spades can mean doing a lot of things together. Spades can encompass a lot. They're the lifestyle suit. So this is one of the strongest cards that represents a working partnership. A successful partnership of any kind requires cooperation. 
So yeah, so it's really uh, the two of spades in general is the symbol of the Aquarian age, the brotherhood of man, the Sanatan Dharma. Um, yeah, interesting. So it's about, uh, unless the two of spades falls in Venus, which it doesn't, it's Mars, it's not considered to be the card of romantic partnership. Even in Venus, it's not guaranteed to be romantic. It could just be working together. So it really is about working together, partnership. So you kind of just get a picture of what this year is about. Spades, hard work, nine, letting go, you know. King of diamonds, much success and power. And two of spades, working with people in partnership. Then you have the six of spades, and that's Jupiter. This card is often considered one of the scariest in the deck. Well, good thing it's in Jupiter. Sixes are karma. When people think about karma, they first think bad karma. See, it's not true. The sixes actually bring a lot of really good things for people, just like nines do. People don't necessarily realize there's certain cards that get kind of maligned because people don't appreciate them. If the six of spades is in a position like Saturn or Pluto, you might indeed experience some very negative karma. Uh, but a six of spades in Jupiter can mean getting promoted to a great job position by someone you helped before, even though you have no memory of helping them. Karma is absolute in this manner. So it's kind of like that theme of, of karmic reward, because it's in Jupiter, getting rewarded for all the hard work you've done in the past. The Six of Spades is a potent symbol of destiny unfolding for an individual. When the Six of Spades, uh, let's, yeah, it can be a signal for a destined occurrence, or it can fundamentally change the course of, of our lives. Um, so it's it's really, um, yeah, it's a karmic karmic change that can happen. Strong karma card. Seven of Diamonds is Uranus. So this is going to be, um, or is that right? Let's see. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter. No, sorry, Saturn. Seven of Diamonds is your Saturn card. And uh, so Olney Richmond says the formation of the spots of a seven card when turned on its side are like a one-way sign. Progress is halted from one direction but allowed from the other. You can kind of see how it's turned sideways. Mm -hmm. it looks like a direction. See, it's kind of... There's an extra one on this side that's not on that side. It's kind of a one-way, kind of one-directional thing. Um, so the secret is the point of view. Is the glass half full or half empty? Um, so the seven, the seven of diamonds will test us. It will test our levels of both having and wanting, which are opposites. Do you have or do you want? This question will be answered by this card's appearance, especially in a prominent position. So for someone who has a good sense of prosperity, the Seven of Diamonds can actually bring the most money of any card in the deck, more even than Eight of Diamonds and Ten of Diamonds, especially in Jupiter. I don't clean up this year, it looks like. Well, but it's in Saturn, so... Yeah, but I mean, I've got all this see. money happening all over the place. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you do have that King of Diamonds, and you have, uh, you know. I know. But, um, yeah, but the Seven of Diamonds and Saturn, it's really testing us. Uh, it's fears based on fearful thoughts. A Seven expressed negatively is a very fearful experience. We're challenged in a deep level. Our fears are revealed in technicolor. Something has threatened us financially, but we must be bold and willing to question our fearful mind. Are we really being threatened? So it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's saying not to, not to worry or not to let the fears get to you. Uh, it can work in almost any position, but perhaps Saturn. The best benefit of the Seven of Diamonds is that it will tell you whether or not you have a healthy prosperity consciousness or not. You will know uh, pretty soon when its influence begins. <laughs> So while it can be generally challenging, um, you know, it's, it's not... Oh, geez, I'm getting some... What are these? Oh, I'm just hearing uh, some notifications here. Sorry. I don't know what's going on Well, there. my prosperity consciousness has seen better days, let's say, that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, but the, the year is still young, and with some of these other cards helping out... Uh, 
Yeah, might, yeah. It might, it might turn around. Okay. Come on, King of Diamonds. <laughs> okay, just a couple more. Um, then we're done here. So the Six of Hearts is Uranus. And so that's another karma card. I mean, it's another very karmic, you know, sixes. There's karmic. three sixes in that in that line in that row right there. Yeah, yeah, it really is. So, yeah. so the sixes can bring destiny or fate. Uh, many things in our life were destined to happen before we were even born. Others are destined because of our choices since birth. Well, that's an interesting perspective. That destiny is both a combination of predestiny as well as karma based on things we've done and uh, it says the word karma can be for the most part misunderstood karma is a lot more than payback it is destiny manifesting before our very eyes so with uranus it can be exciting changes you know spontaneous if you think about um oh if it falls in one of the two spiritual periods uranus or neptune it can portend a psychic opening, psychic events, spiritual awakenings. It can also mean a peaceful time when life flows. And during such peaceful times, we can both hear the voice of the unseen and be guided by our unfolding destiny. So that sounds like a very supportive card. We're getting to the last ones here. Uh, just two left. And thank you for your patience in all I mean, these I'm cards. I, I've been, but I'm wondering is if anybody else is going to get anything out of this. Suppose I think they the, will. Some I, I, sense of how this works, if nothing else. Yeah, I think they will. And I think it's interesting to them to kind of see interpretations and just to see that sure. this is a system. Some people might go, oh, I'm not for me, not interested. Other people might go, wow, I want to look at my cards for the year and I want to understand, sure. you know, what I have going on and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... So the Jack represents, the Jack of Hearts is the initiation into a higher mode of being. On a mundane level, it's akin to a commoner being invited to join the royal family in the palace, a transformation of their lifestyle on all levels. Yeah, it's the first royalty card because hearts are the first suit. So it's the first non-numbered card. So Jack of Hearts is like being invited into the royalty. This initiation quality of the Jacks causes them to have special benefits for everyone but especially those on the spiritual path. Being initiated into a higher path, spiritually speaking, is possible. Uh, so the Jack of Hearts, uh, so this is your Neptune card. Interesting, I wonder if he says, uh, there may be a sacrifice because it's the card of sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice that initiates you to a higher level. The Jack of Hearts can inspire us to rise to a new level in areas of love, family, friendship, romance, or sex. All of these fall under the jurisdiction of hearts. It's an initiation to a higher love or way of being in regards to love and sex. Uh, so, yeah, so it's basically, um, it, it kind of depends where it is because it's in Neptune. It seems like very mystical, very spiritual probably being you know initiated it's a spiritual influence more spiritual than the other jacks um, so spiritually for spiritually minded people it brings a transformation to a higher level and then our well i guess we have two cards left we have the pluto card the ten of hearts and this is kind of urging us pluto is always urging transformation and then the pluto result is the six of clubs what you get if you go through with the transformation. So you're right, you'd have three sixes here in your spread. A lot of karma, a lot of destiny this year. So when the 10 of hearts appears, this can be a time of great success with groups of people. It can be a large family or a gathering of friends, or it could be an audience of thousands of people. It spells a time of success with the public, where success with the public comes easily and is rewarding. Uh, so tens are opportunities, and the ten of hearts brings the possibility of recognition and success with people. The larger number of people, the better. So it can become obsessive, though. Uh, it can be obsessed with popularity or obsessed with social activity. 
could be too much focus on one's popularity, too many group events to attend. Uh, this can be common with Ten of Hearts as found in Pluto. So because Pluto may, it leads to the obsession. So it can be, uh, you, might, you may find yourself experiencing a lot of success under a Ten of Hearts, um, but you know the long view is the wise one. With the proper awareness, the success of the Ten of Hearts will come and go, and you'll be faultless. So it's kind of just saying, uh, don't, don't worry too much about it, but it can definitely bring a lot of, um, and it's kind of, the Pluto is how we undergo transformation. So this is transforming your life through connection to larger groups of people and reaching more people and connecting with people. And then finally, the Six of Clubs. This is the Cosmic Reward card. This is the octave of Jupiter. And this is what you get by successfully going through that transformation. Um, you, you won't always get it if you can't go through that transformation, right? Pluto kind of demands that we transform. The Six of Clubs is known as the Missionary card. Many Six of Clubs people discover their life as a special purpose, one in which they become a vessel for higher knowledge that helps others. Clubs are knowledge and thinking and the mind, uh, you know, communication. And sixes are karma. So they're, they're kind of, it comes from the deepest place uh, within. Many people are searching in their life for a special purpose. Many clients come with, can you help me find purpose in life? And that's asking a lot of a reader. It's a question whose answer could guide a person for all or most of their life, but it's not really a question that a reader can answer. Answer, the reader can give clues, but nothing can say. But nothing any reader can say would replace the inner knowing that is unquestionable. However, looking for the six of clubs in one's life and what years that occurs, you can tell when they will are likely to make that discovery for themselves. So the reward is the deep certitude and deep understanding of of life purpose and of being a vessel of higher knowledge for others. So that sounds pretty good to me. Okay. <laughs> Comments, thoughts, questions, anything? Oh, that's wild. Um, damn. Well, I'm glad that I'll have this to refer to all year. <laughs> but I should would should not, we call it? Is it getting, yeah. yeah. I would not seek out this kind of fortune telling it typically well yeah really i mean i'm sure know. for a, for a lot of people in human design too it's going to be kind of uh oh that's mind fodder and you know that could be tricking us into thinking we have some control over our life and all this stuff but it's right. just it's just about awareness sure i mean it's 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 interesting you know it'll be interesting to see how that how it goes how that, how that comes comes through if it does yeah yeah exactly and i mean these these are just archetypes they're kind of it's kind of like the ray v ching where you can read a line from it and you have to kind of figure out how that's going to apply in your life because it's talking about such a generic it's not really so all right well um i guess are we good for now i mean what are you how that's are you probably enough i think that's probably enough yeah. for, for, let's, let's for today I think yeah. it was a real joy for me, and uh, I really appreciate having you on, as always. And thanks for letting me to use, you know, that was the first reading I'd ever given of the cards, even though I pretty much just read from a book. But uh, it was still enjoyable for me, and I, I hope you get something out of it. And uh, as always, really wonderful having you on. Um, thank you for having me. That was... <laughs> I did get something out of it. I'm sure I did. <laughs> but and then there was that whole other conversation we had also, which was great. Yeah, we covered a lot of ground today. So yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thanks for joining. And thanks, everyone for listening. Till next time. <laughs>